Breakfast with Cassandra. First of all, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I was so looking forward to this. Not not only me, but also Jessie. Yeah. She really likes your music. That's okay. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jessie. We'll be Jessie Squared today. <laughs> um, I wanted to start at the very beginning because I was wondering if you still knew your very first memory that you connect with music. I remember being like little, like maybe 10 years, I don't know, maybe 10, thinking I knew what heartbreak was and then hearing Otis Redding's Try a Little Tenderness and being like, oh, like my heart was in the grips of despair and I was just so dramatic and it felt like I was like being comforted through music. I think that's that's one of the early ones. Like I can list so many times with so many different artists, but that's one of the earlier ones. And then I felt like a fucking hipster when when Kanye and Jigga came out with a, with a sample because I was like, yeah, like talking to the general population. I was like, yeah, I didn't know this song. I was 10 years old singing this shit for my soul, you know? But that's one of the early ones with Otis. So you can also remember your first heartbreak? Uh, Who was a person? My first real heartbreak was when I was in high school. Yeah, Like that's the one that I couldn't ha handle. Like it was the first time that emotion had ever caused me physical pain like unbearable physical pain which is a whole it's just it for everybody who's ever gone through it i feel like it's fair to say that it's such a it's such it's such an intense realization when you're like this thing that you can't touch so you can't touch love you know you can't but it but it but it hurts to the point where you're like what's in me like it just feels like poison it feels like my it feels like i'm inside out that was intense for me to kind of rationalize that this is life like something that you can't see can fucking kill you or feel like it's killing you uh i was in high school yeah mm -hmm. and it has a real impact on your physical being yeah right that is so weird so weird but how did you deal with it then i didn't deal with it uh -huh. i uh i drank a lot and i just i was depressed i had a really hard time in high school still we're high talking school. about that time yeah right? we're talking about that time and uh My parents really, they looked out as much as they could because I didn't really make it easy. Um, but yeah, I didn't really deal with it. It took me a long, long time to to learn how to cope. It took me a long time to learn how to cope. How much time do you think? Five years. Mm -hmm. Five years to be kind of okay. And I still had remnants of the, like, just how traumatized I was. Mm -hmm. But I think it took me about, like, five years, which sounds so long, but... But we were together since I was like 14. Like I was, you mm. know what I mean? It was first love and we were together for so long. Yeah. But I love how it happened because he's great and we're friends and he's like married with kids and, and I'm living my life. And it's, you know, we obviously don't talk like we used to, but mm. it's very, um, it's, it's, I feel like when you, when you l are in love that young with someone, it's not even like an ex, like that's my childhood friend. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. But how did you um, get the information that he was engaged or gonna marry? Was there a second uh, like, heartbreak Instagram. season? No. <laughs> <laughs> no, there wasn't a second heartbreak season. I was happy for him. I was happy for him. So much time had passed that it was like, you know, yeah. happy for him. Yeah, okay. That's very good because yeah. first love, it does have an impact on you. It does. Right? It does. Yeah, it does. But luckily enough time had passed that I, and you know, it's just, yeah, enough time had passed yeah. that, that it was just, I'm happy for him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What made you fall in love with music then? It just always felt like home. It always felt like home. Maybe like in this life where we're, we're like moving through it and trying different things and exploring different disguises on our outer body because even our body is kind of a disguise you know what i mean so, but from my heart and from my soul my spirit it just always felt at home with music it gave me a language with which to communicate and with which to art articulate myself with ease in a way that, that i don't really find i can do when i'm just speaking to someone mm -hmm. as much as i can articulate like a conversation like this as much as i can make my ideas clear when it comes to dealing with my emotions and speaking with people that I've had relationships with for years it's definitely not as easy but with music it's a lot easier for me when the, when the emotion is thick I can't get my tongue to work mm. but when the emotions thick guitars and mics and singing it just comes out fluid so all of that yeah can you still remember the first time you wrote a song I, I remember one of the first songs I wrote But I don't remember writing it. I just remember my mom finding it and feeling 
offended that that she had like found it and read it and but it was ironic because i think i was like grade five or grade four and the song was about not growing up too fast yeah which is ironic because what the fuck do i know about not growing up too fast <laughs> when you're in grade five but it was a little a little dollar store notebook and she went through there and then oh yeah my mom was, would snoop everything <laughs> everything but i think that's a motherly trait yeah right yeah Fair. would you do it to your daughter though probably you would uh, probably especially young because there's things that there's things that uh that i know now that she snooped and would like orchestrate mm -hmm. that i understand was for my greater good because at the time i didn't know you know what i mean mm, for example hiding liquor bottles mm -hmm. <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> things like that and and showing up at parties like I, it was it was it was intense for me at the time like if i went to a party with some friends and we were like 15 or 16 and there was underage drinking going on and she couldn't get a hold of me they showed up at a party once and my mom and dad pulled up and they pulled me out of there and then maybe like when we were driving away cop cars were coming to the party so i'm like she literally there's moments saved like that. you yeah there's moments like that where i'm like okay i get it like yeah. there's things that because that was that was my next question do you th really think that her interference had an impact yeah it could but both good and bad because no one's perfect you mm -hmm. know my, my mom's damn near close because she's very saintly and very sweet and very good and kind and all all those things but it also made me like if you ask anybody who knew me back then they'd tell you that i was just a little dick uh, rebellious without a without a ne without necessarily like a big reason And I think that just having a short lease made me search for the axe to cut it off a lot quicker than I might have had I been given more freedom. Than, than I might, like I might not have had I been given more freedom when I was younger. But they were very protective. I was yeah. the youngest, their youngest daughter. Okay. So I get yeah, it. Sure. But it definitely made me more sneaky. <laughs> What made you calm down then? Finding out that they were one of the only people there for me after my first depression and learning to appreciate that um that i'm one of the anomalies that has a like a having parents that are that care and like they're there for me and i can trust them and then i've realized that not everyone's lucky enough to be born into a family like that sometimes like you can sometimes you just don't get that sometimes parents are assholes and mine aren't so I'm lucky. And then I'm lucky also to have them, like, to have family, you know, and and have two of them. Because I know some people don't even have one that's good, and I got two good ones. So I'm very aware of how lucky I am. And I think that after coming to a little bit of consciousness and and getting my head out of my ass and maturing a little bit, when I looked around, there wasn't many people there for me outside of them, mm -hmm. you know? So that made me... That made me change and appreciate and learn and grow. Yeah. Did you did you tell that to your parents? They What know. What was the reaction? I mean, they they try to. They're like, oh, it's like people go through it. Teenagers go through it. Children go through it. Yeah. They try to brush it off. But I apologize often. Like I, I apologize often, and I try to make it up to them because because things could have been different. They could have given up on me, and they didn't. You mm -hmm. know. So yeah. I'm trying to pay them back. The dividends. I'm just giving them money back on the investment <laughs> that they made, you know? So that's well, that's the ROI they were hoping for, ROI I guess. ROI they were hoping for. I would agree. It is the ROI. It is the ROI they were hoping for. Um, when it comes to your lyrics, um, or your music in general, well, the one that li lyrics are the songs that you release, they tend to be a little more on the sadder side. Mm -hmm. Funny. Very funny. But also really sad and <laughs> I, I saw an interview you where you where you said that yeah you write those you write those sad songs but but you also write happy songs yeah. and i was wondering what about the happy songs doesn't feel right enough to release them i don't know maybe it's because i'm not as drawn to make them i've said this before that i write sad songs and hurt like music more so when i'm hurt because i feel like when i'm happy i can live in the emotion and i don't have a knee-jerk reaction to get it out but when i'm sad it's like if i had something poison in me i don't have to think about throwing up if something's fucking up my stomach it just happens you know what i mean mm -hmm. so it's more so of a reaction instead of a conscious effort mm -hmm. and when i'm happy i could just live in it so i don't i don't make as much due to the nature of how i respond to emotion 
So that might affect how much comes out because it's just a matter of quantity. And um, I just don't think I'm as good at it, to be completely honest with you. Like, I don't think I'm as good at it. I, that's one of the reasons that I love Bob Marley so much because I feel like you could be in a sad room and you put on Bob Marley and the frequency goes up, mm-hmm. you know? And it just, it's so, it's so, it's so powerful and potent. And especially in English, you run the risk of sounding cheesy when you get too happy. I don't think you do it in Spanish. Spanish, there's thick poetry and alliteration and love songs that are just like so, just so this, molasses, and it doesn't sound cheesy. Yeah. But in English, sometimes yeah. when I hear pop songs and, they're, and I'm like... That is so funny because I had Moniskin here on Monday. I don't know oh, if you nice. know them. They're yeah, yeah. Italian rock band, right? Yeah, yeah. And they sing in Italian, but they also do English songs. And I was like, I have a different connection to the different languages I speak. And... For me, also, English is a very, you can be cheesy, you can say stuff that I would never say in German because they're so cringy. And you saying the same about Spanish and English yeah. is so funny. Yeah, yeah, that's how it hits me. It is funny, right? Yeah. Like, that's how it hits me. Uh, yeah, I think that's probably why. I just don't, I don't think I'm as good at it and it comes out natural, not more, it comes out in a much more natural way for me when I'm sad or hurt then when I'm happy yeah so you're also not thinking about in which language you want to write a song right now so it just it just happens you have a line in your head so it's it really sounds like it's a coping mechanism does it probably you're probably right I, I don't know <laughs> you, you can correct me but it sounds like um you being sad and you need an outlet and that's why you write a song and you don't even have the urge when you're happy you're not even thinking about writing something yeah maybe it might it might, it might be that It might be a it might be a self coping mechanism. I wouldn't. It's not like I feel much better after. You don't. So, no, I feel good that something's been made. So at least I feel like a like I feel something good came out of a negative thing. Something, yeah. Mm. Some, yeah. Like at least I feel connected with my creativity, and 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 semi accomplished after something is done. At least something came from it. You know, so yeah, I guess it's it's a little bit of a turning a, an L into a W. But to say I feel better after isn't, I don't necessarily know if that's the case. Because it's like picking a scab, you know? Mm -hmm. But then also, why do you do it if you don't feel? Why does a fish swim? Yeah, I know. <laughs> you know? Why yeah, does a fish just swim? Natural to I just you. do it, yeah. It's yeah. not really, an, I'm just fortunate, I guess. Not I guess. I'm fortunate because I know that it's just I feel at home. I feel at home in music. Even when I'm sad, I feel at home in music. So, yeah, fuck. It just is what it is. <laughs> Are there times that it doesn't feel right, where music doesn't feel like home, where it's kind of hard for you sometimes, maybe? Just the mu just like the business side. Mm -hmm. Just the business side, because... I've said this before in interviews and at the risk of sounding redundant, I'm going to say it again, but I've said like music industry is like saying holy money. It's an oxymoron because how can you have something so beautiful and then stick the word industry be like beside it and monopolize something that is in all reality, something that you can't even touch. You can't even touch waves. That's sound. That's magic. So I think that that's a joke in and of itself. But also i'm very fortunate to be within this industry because i'm able to make money off art and make mm. money off emotion and live and like be a working musician and help my family and you know so that's great but yes you could be grateful for something but still acknowledge the negative sides of it and sometimes in the music industry it's a little difficult to swallow the the uh the politics yeah the marketing The logistics, the statistics, the all of the all of the stuff that's not as um, glamorous, magic, magic, magical. Yeah, yeah. What of what of that aspect, industry ad aspect, would have busted your bubble, bursted your bubble um, the most when you were younger and dreaming about being a musician f for for a living? I've learned to I've learned to deal with it now, hmm. but when I first was lucky enough to experience first level of success. I had a, a sudden shift of people viewing me like a commodity, like an object, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And then 
and then having people acquaintances and even some like just even even people I knew that weren't supportive and didn't believe in me being able to make a life in music and then a few years pass and then you know it's a very it's a very it's a story that gets told often of people being like you weren't there for me when I was mm. fucking struggling and I came up and now you're here mm -hmm. that story is so common it gets repeated often and I went through it and I had a difficult time and I started becoming a little bit more reclusive and more guarded and more just reclusive and guarded and my family saw and pretty much grounded me they helped me get rooted because my mom was like if you get bitter because you have success like what do you think that's going to perpetuate in your life mm -hmm. and you're you're letting yourself get in your emotions because of someone else's reaction when they might have just been projecting their own limitations on you. Mm -hmm. You know, that mm -hmm. might not even have been a correct reflection of how they felt about you because it's just a reflection of them. And then my dad kept it very short. His curtness was very present when he was like, fuck do you want? You want people to call you when you're losing? And I was like, like yeah, that, that's not yeah human. I do. But people don't do that. That's not yeah. human nature. You know, people cheer in the stands when you're winning. People cheer for you when you're winning. People don't fucking call you when you're losing. Yeah. People call you when you're like, oh, congratulations, you know? And I was like, true. And that just helped me deal with it more. And it helped me, like, accept that sometimes human nature isn't that pretty, but that I shouldn't let it poison my experience. And so I've learned to cope with it. But when I started and that shift happened, and then I started feeling like people would just look at me and see a dollar sign. Or people would look at me and see an opportunity to like, I don't know, just look at me as an opportunity. I don't fault people also. for it anymore. Yeah. I don't fault people for it. I just let it go. Yeah. But that would have, that would have, it was hard to swallow and it would have burst my bubble had I known that that was going to be a stepping stone later on in my career. If I, it, yeah, it would have burst my bubble younger. Yeah. But it wouldn't have hold you back. No, to thank God, because I grew, because I'm growing still. Yeah. I already told you that you're not the only Jesse in the room. The yeah, other Jesse is great. right here. Hey. And one <laughs> and uh, one of her favorite songs of yours is Who Are You When No One's in the Room. Oh, sick. And we both were wondering if you ever found an answer to that question. Awareness. I really love Eckhart Tolle. If you guys have ever read The Power of Now, but that book is so beautiful. But when I, when I work on... When I do shadow work and when I, yeah, when I'm just, I, I'm still getting to know myself, but in moments where I have clarity and in moments when I'm trying to get connected to whatever it is that I am, I feel, I feel like whatever is, uh, whatever is looking at you through my eyes mm -hmm. is the same thing that's looking at me through yours, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, it's and kind that, of awkward, that, but yeah. It's weird, but it's but that awareness, I think, I think, like this is a school of thought that I subscribe to, I think it's one and the same. So it's just presence and awareness and being connected to that oneness to now. Mm -hmm. I feel like that's, like, don't you, it, yeah. I, when I talk about it, that's something yeah. like, every time I talk about it, I feel like my skin kind of, yeah. I don't know how to say that in English. It just, like, goosebumps, goosebumps a little. Goosebumps, yeah. 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 Goosebumps a little, but I feel that, I feel like when I'm able to be, connected to the moment i'm awareness when no one's in the room i'm awareness i'm not even me i'm just like me is me is the experience me is the body but me is is wow that's not english i sound like <laughs> kevin from the office me is observing <laughs> sorry i just went to caveman speak yeah I when I am in the room, I feel like I am. Well, no, when I fuck me, when no one's in the room, when no one's in the room, and I'm reflecting on myself, and I'm able to just get connected. I feel like I am awareness. Yeah, but do you have to force yourself to do that? Not force myself, but I have to Con consciously do yeah. it. It's not so. It, pff, I fuck. I wish I could. I feel like monks do that naturally. You know, people that walk in religious rites or that walk in religious uh worlds they that who work on it who practice it doing it every day and i try to do that but it's difficult you know but if i can find moments in the day where I, like right now when we were talking about it i feel like i did it mm -hmm. you know yeah if if i'm on stage and i make a mistake and then my thoughts start running i'll do a quick meditation and i'll just bring my on awareness stage? yeah i'll bring because sometimes the thoughts get loud if i miss something and i'm like fuck and then i r realize i start um harping because mm -hmm. We are our own worst critic, you know, and when you make a mistake, 
it's it's hard to swallow especially if you, it's if, if if it's what you do you know mm-hmm. what i mean yeah. so i start judging myself and i'm like i can't believe you did that and then i realize i'm like oh my negative i'm speaking to myself negatively when i'm doing something and i'm in the moment and i should be grateful for what it is that's happening how do i bring myself back to the now instead of using thoughts i'll try to use body awareness so i'll bring my awareness down from my brain down my spine down to my knee i don't know why but my knee always works mm. but i just bring my awareness to my knee and then all of a sudden i'm present again and the thoughts are quiet and then i'm in the moment yeah so i have to consciously do it it's not something that i could do unconsciously yeah well from an outside perspective at least uh you can correct me um it seems like you're so confident um in your lyrics in the way you speak in your body on stage Was it always like that? Absolutely not. No. <laughs> no. Absolutely not. I've definitely gone through this. It's been peaks and valleys, you know? I'm sure at one point when I was like 15, no, I'm not, yeah, when I was like 14, 15, I was an asshole. So I was overly confident. And then life comes and humbles you and you go down here and then you build it up again and then you go down here and it's just this. But um, I work on self-love. I do affirmations every day. Yeah. Um, like I just said, I try to correct thought patterns when I'm talking down to myself because i've come to see that like if the life is hard enough and if the little voice in your head is against you all you're doing is making life harder for yourself so you you can adjust that voice just to come from a different supportive point of view mm-hmm. it makes your mistakes a lot easier to swallow and it adds grace like it gives you grace to be able to correct yourself without walking through life with the guilt of not being perfect because everybody's imperfect so it just yeah. it's just life yeah so, no, it wasn't always like that. And I work on it every day. And I work on self-love. And I work on being healthy in every single way. Like, spiritually, physically, mentally, every way. Yeah. What started that journey? Failing. Mm-hmm. Depression. All of that. And it's been this. Because I... Because that's life, you know? I've It takes sometimes hardships for you to take inventory of where shit's at. And something that I used to do that was bad was... As soon as things got good, I would um, fall off of doing my maintenance. So, like, I'd, I don't know, go to therapy and go to yoga and work out, and then everything would get better, and I'd feel better. And then I'd be like, cool, I'm I'm cured. I'm fixed. I'm yeah. fixed. Yeah. And then you stop doing maintenance. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. That's like never filling your car up again, thinking that you're going to run on, on the gas that you filled up once forever, but that's just not possible. Yeah. So I've learned that um, maintenance is important. Consistency is important. Yeah. But yeah, that's when I learned it, the downs in life and then and then learning how to get back up. But I don't expect to be like as happy and as peaceful as I feel right now. I know that that's not sustainable because that's just not life, Mm -hmm. you know. But my dad gave me some really good piece of advice a long time ago. He was like, in life, if you're able to not get too high on the highs and not get too lows on the lows, you can coast as long as you find that median. You know what I mean? And stay peaceful even when shit's good and even when shit's bad. Just stay here. Stay stay in the middle. And I've tried to do that more and I feel like it's worked. Your dad is the wise one in the family, sounds like. So is my mom. My dad's just more... <laughs> <laughs> But um, the maintenance thing is also um, a question I had because I feel like if when people talk about therapy, um, often the focus shifts to the result of, of the therapy, right? What came out of it? Because we're so result-driven. And you, like, well, people don't see what what hard work it is really to not only like realize that you want to work on yourself, that you have to work on yourself and also stick to it. Do you feel like that that's true? That it's hard? uh, Yeah, that it's hard. And also that the conversation is not about the working part, but about the result often. Oh, yeah. But that's the human plight. Yeah. Isn't it? People are always so concerned. It's the fucking, it's the, it's the, it's the, uh, it's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Hmm. Yeah. It's such a fucking cliche, but no one yeah. really applies it because people are so result driven. Yeah. So yeah, I think, but that, I think that's just part of the human experience for you to just kind of dance between awareness that that's the truth and also forgetting it so that you can get back to the awareness mm-hmm. that that's the truth. But yeah, it's difficult. It's hard and it's not a, there's no cure. Because if you're cured, you're probably dying tomorrow. Because that means that you don't have any other experience. Hmm. You know what I mean? Life yeah. is experience. Life is about like falling and then getting back up and falling and getting back up and learning what you want to suffer for because suffering is inevitable. And as dismal as that might sound, that's just life. 
So the day that you feel like you're completely cured, you're probably dying tomorrow because that means that you don't like yeah. that means you're done. Yeah. And I just don't I've never met anyone outside of monks. I never met anyone. And even monks, they have to do that every day. Mm. You know, mm. it's not like they just like achieve peace and then they're like done and they don't go to temple and they don't meditate and they don't do maintenance like they reach that level and then maintain yeah. so if a monk has to maintain what the fuck makes you think you don't you know what i mean yeah but it also sounds like you buried happily ever after like what do you, mean? you buried the idea of i don't think it exists right yeah i don't do you I mean, if you I do, was no hoping, shame. No, no, I was hoping for it. It's, it's always in the back of your head. Like, the fini- there's there's some the kind of line. finish line. Yeah, where you're, you're like... Line in life. That's cool. The older I get, I, no, I no. don't. <laughs> I don't. I mean, I, I was like, when I was 20, I was like, oh gosh, when, when you're 30, you're going to know your shit. You, you're yeah, going to have I your family, this, that. this and that. Yeah. And you don't have to do the mental work and stuff like that. But I'm... 31 now and i was i'm like i don't know shit do you remember to be you remember being 10 years old and talking to a 30 year old and being like There's you so have all the answers you, you know have everything you know everything yeah. and, and trusting yeah uh, yeah there's no they don't they know don't shit they don't know <laughs> no, nobody know a fucking thing that's crazy i it's just but crazy it's also scary it's scary you. nobody knows anything yeah. everybody's guessing it's scary but it's also comforting because nobody knows shit so if anyone's judging you fucking up who the <laughs> fuck are they to judge because nobody knows shit yeah you know and i think maybe i mean if if it's lovely that you have this optimistic perspective or this optimistic hope of an ever after it's just a different iteration of an ever after because to me ever after is learning how to cope forever that's my happily ever after you know learning how to cope forever yeah Yeah. but maybe it exists maybe i'm wrong i don't know shit (laughs) maybe i'm wrong nobody does apparently yeah Yeah. um what was the hardest part for you working on in your therapy or what was there what are you most proud of that you tackled what what topic or i'm just i'm i'm happy that i i don't know about a topic i'm just happy that i made um in times in my life where I felt overwhelmed, I made it a point to make it a priority. I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but f- feeling um, validated in my struggle without a re- without a solution, because it's not like my therapist offered me solutions, but just provided space for me to be sad, made the weight lift in a way i just never expected and so that to me was a it just um i've never felt i've never I've not, i'm not one to vent to people and i've said this before like i'm just not one i'm not one to vent i'm not one to come to somebody and talk about something for them to listen i'm usually going to someone for solutions and if there's no solution i don't got to tell you shit i don't really need to talk about it i'll deal with it myself because everyone has their own problems so that is a new space for me especially with a stranger but being able to, um, yeah, being able to just let everything out and there not being a solution in sight because at the time it was one of those times in life, you know, when everything goes wrong, like Murphy's Law comes around and starts mm-hmm. kicking shit down. Hell yeah. Everything was going left and it was so heavy and I had not a solution in sight and I just let it all out. And even though there wasn't a solution in the room, I felt better because I just had space to be sad and space to be hurt and space to be scared it's almost just having that space let me not feel this way down i could breathe which what, is fucked y- totally but what made you feel like you you're not allowed to or yeah not allowed to let it out before for what for what like what i said earlier like if why would i let it out if no if i don't see someone in the vicinity of my like if i if i don't see someone in my social circle that, that can help me. Yeah. Why? Why? I would just wait for a solution or wait till I figure out a solution or, you know? Yeah. I just wouldn't want to burden anybody. So it made me always feel like I didn't really want to do that. Hmm. Yeah. And now you do that with people also? Or do I, you just allow it to yourself? I'm learning to do it. It's still not natural for me and it's still very difficult. I'm learning. I'm learning. It's a... There's a, there's a learning curve still. Yeah. So still learning. But it's nice to know that I'm capable of it because before I wasn't capable. Mm-hmm. Now I'm capable. I just still don't do it as often as maybe I should. But um, yeah, 
also I have a therapist, so like I don't need to burden a bunch of people in my life. <laughs> I'm paying that. I'm paying my therapist. I'm gonna burden anybody I can burden her. Yeah. But also you like um needing like five years after your first heartbreak, um, for yourself to figure it out and to overcome it. And then also now saying that um you don't really wanna share your struggles with other people. It sounds like you're not one to easily open up to people and really let people in. No, but my dude through my music, which is so fucking funny. Yeah, you're like, so open and vulnerable with your music. music. But when when it comes to like actually talking to somebody about it yeah. in your inner circle, maybe. Yeah, you're, you're right. Not, yeah, you're right. That's why I think that's why I'm lucky I have music because I'd be fucked otherwise. I'd be a fucking <laughs> kettle without it. I'd be a kettle on the oven without a little... You know, <laughs> yeah. So. But what makes you share the music then, if it's that intimate? What makes you share that with other people? I don't know. I said I kind of said it earlier. Like I don't know why a fish swims. I just do. I don't know why. And I'm really lucky because I don't want to be doing anything else. I've been fired from many, many jobs. So if I didn't have this, I think I'd be fucked. And I don't think money is the answer and money isn't the be all end all. But unfortunately, we live in a capitalistic ass world where you have to pay to breathe and pay to be a human, which is fucked in and of itself. But acknowledging the context that we're in makes me very grateful that even though I don't know why a fish swims, I'm lucky I do. You know what I mean? So I don't know why, but I just do. Do you ever feel insecure before you release a song that is like rarely only only when it's um walking the line of uh intimacy when someone else knows who I'm talking about because I've made the decision to be open in my music but the people in my life it's not like they chose this career and it's not like I put names in my songs but every now and then if someone knows someone that knows someone then all of a sudden their business is out you know but I do my best to keep it as um as a uh, anonymous or as unidentifiable as possible. Mm. Did you have to ask for permission? No. Nope. Sometimes before. No, because I don't put no fucking names. Yeah. So <laughs> 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 if I put names I would, but I don't I don't yeah. use names like that. So Okay. No. no worries on that end. Um you've been touring so much you've been on tour with Billie Eilish now you're on tour with your own um with your own album you announced that you're gonna go, go on tour with Sam Smith yeah. girl you don't need a home what is going on no man I'm happy as hell on the road <laughs> I'm happy yeah? yeah is that your favorite part about be making music being an artist it's one of them mm -hmm. my favorite like top tier is is being in the studio or being in my house whatever it, when I'm creating is my favorite I think it it's pretty much tied is performing, and both of those is because it feels very present. Everything else, it's uh, like it's just it's it's uh it's hard not to get lost in the minutia of of uh, building and and being strategic and thinking of release dates and thinking of features and thinking of just you know mm -hmm. building a castle. But those two things, by n nature of what they are, you have to be present. So the being present on stage and being present in the moment where I'm creating are just two things that for me are very sacred. I'm happy shit to be on the road yeah happy as shit especially because i'm i feel like i'm not healthy i'm probably the healthiest i've ever been in my life so how do you do it work out oh, no. sing drink a lot of water pray period you've been doing it for almost two years i guess so huh it seems like it right yeah. you were when was the time you were on tour with billy eilish it was last year right was it when was it 2021 20 yeah last summer last that summer. was last summer Crazy. It's so crazy. Crazy. Yeah. Feels great. <laughs> <laughs> How did you find your routine and staying sane? Um consistency. I just I I have learned that um doing the things that you don't want to do or learning how to do the things that you don't want to do more often is a gift to yourself. You know, that builds discipline. And then also momentum, I've said, is a gift from the gods because the second that you could like do things for one day and then two days and then three days and all of a sudden three turns to five and all of a sudden five turns to ten. And when you see ten, you don't want to break your streak, you mm -hmm. know. And when you celebrate little wins, you beget more wins, I think. So that really helps. So I just focus on consistency, focus on little wins and then and then uh, and do the shit that I don't want to do. 
so, sometimes I don't want to go to the gym, but I know that it's for my... Yeah, last what, last night was two o'clock in the morning. You know, last night was two o'clock in the yeah. morning. But if I, but I, I like, where does bond for me? So if I said I'm going to do something that day, even if you it's late, I'm going to do it. it. Yeah. I'm, I'm still going to do it. And I, and I, and it's just an hour. What's an hour? You know, if I'm ever tired and I'm like, what's an hour? What's 60 minutes? Nothing. Just at least 60 minutes. You could, you could give up 60 minutes in your day. Yeah. For yourself. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. So that helps. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What is, um, what do you like about being a support act on a tour in comparison to being the main act on being your own tour? Early nights. Because you can go see the city more and explore and just be more human, yeah. which is nice. And the pressure is not as intense. Um, but the downside is that you walk out an uphill battle because everyone isn't there to see you. So you have to be like, hi, my name is this. And like, you know, pretty much just like it's like a first date, yeah. you know. So the pressure, is that even though you don't have the pressure of being the main show, it's an uphill battle. And and I've had both experiences of being the opener with the uphill battle and also being spoiled because you're spoiled when you walk into a room and people are there to see you and they're waiting for you and they know all the songs that's such a beautiful experience it's so it's such it's such a beautiful iteration of of abstract love because there's people that you've never met but for whatever reason you have this intimate connection you know a symbiotic intimate connection so it's beautiful um but yeah Early nights, pressure isn't as intense, but it's definitely made me a better artist because I have to work harder for those nights. And then when it's my own set, seeing friends that I have never met before, you know? Yeah. It's that, having having that moment to have that connection with people. It's just, it's like we skip a step. It's like it's like going on the first date, but not the first date. It's like, like we're married. We have memories together now, you know? Especially in the moment yeah. because it's, because it's a moment because now, Everyone in that room and me are all gonna ha have this moment in time that we made, that we co-created. So I think that's beautiful. So I love that. It is beautiful, but the thing that I'm like so curious about is that you call those people a friend as well. Because when I see somebody on stage and I connect with that person because I've been listening to their music for years and stuff like that, I would be like, or even listening to a podcast, you know, when you have like a podcast that you're really addicted to, you're like, oh my gosh, I love them. In my head, we're best friends. Same, but, right? Yeah. But you being the other person, you being the podcaster, you being the artist, <laughs> and you still calling, <laughs> still calling them your friends. That is... That is so cool, but also strange. It's symbiotic for me. I'm, a, I'm. What aware. do you get out of that? Because get a friendship is, is uh, no, Sim but yeah, because a friendship goes both ways, right? What do you get from that? Calling it a friendship. My life. Yeah. My life. I wouldn't be living the life I'm living. I could be coming over here, and the rooms could be empty, and I'd be fucked. Yeah. I'd be fucked. So I'm like. Everyone in that room has gifted me the life I'm living. How could I not be eternally grateful? How could I not how could I not feel that level of intimacy? Especially because I've been on both ends. Mm -hmm. Like you said, like there's there's people I've listened to my whole life that I feel like when I didn't have understanding, they were my friend in the dark, even though we'd never met. But their words were a bridge from soul to soul that made me feel seen. Mm -hmm. You know? So Because I've been on both ends and because I know I, that I'm, I, my life and my whole experience and my whole identity, my whole, like, the life I'm living is only made possible through the support of people that have connected with my music. So how could I not be connected? I get that. And it's really humble of you, but it's also rare. Really? Yeah, it is. Seriously. Yeah, not a lot of artists see it that way. Oh, I fuck. mean it. Well, shit. Maybe I don't know. I've struggled a lot. Maybe it's because I've been, I've been in empty rooms before. I've been in fucking open mics where there was like two people there. I've been, but everyone, I guess, yeah. Some people get success easy, and some people don't. And I feel like I didn't. I feel like I had to work. I, I've, yeah. Maybe that's it. And I, and I have really good parents. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know. It shows. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, I was so excited when I saw that you had a new song coming out together with Sam Smith and Coffee. I was like, oh my gosh, that's so amazing. How how did that come? Well, actually, Sam and I met through Calvin Harris. And then we developed our own friendship. And then Sam was like, I'm doing a, a 
you know, just going to Jamaica to write, pull up. And I was like, woo. And I went and I loved I love it there. <laughs> it's so beautiful. I was out in the ocean every day. And I'm not a morning person, but they like to work in the day. So I was real. I, I had no choice. I was like, well, fuck it. I guess I'm a morning person because I wanted to go out. And it yeah. was just the most beautiful experience. And in the day, I would just go see puffer fish and eagle rays and take the paddleboard deep out. And it was just perfect. And then and then I go work all day in the studio with them. And it was great. I and mean, I loved it. And there was some drinking involved. May or may not have been a hangover. But woke up the next day and Gimme was made. So it was a great, great So you time. woke up the next day and the song was done? That was it? No, it's it's a it's okay. a chisel. It's a chisel. Mm-hmm. I wish it was completely done, but it wasn't completely done. But the seed, the impetus, the the origin, yeah, the early signs of a <laughs> the early signs of a song were there. Yeah. How did Coffee get involved? Sam and their team reached out to Coffee, and then we all linked up with the music video, and it was cool. The music video is on point as well. It was freaking cold. Yeah, it was. was It didn't look cold, I know. (laughs) I know. We're all great actors, but it was cold as hell. Yeah. Where was it? New York. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That was great, though. Yeah. Yeah, the result is amazing. (laughs) Um, No pain, no gain. Nah. I was wondering, um, because if you... If you are working in that industry do you have the urge to connect with other artists on a friendship level sometimes because those are the only people that m- understand certain plights and certain issues and not everyone is gonna I- identify or empathize with um with certain experiences that i have because they haven't walked in those shoes whereas other artists have mm-hmm. so yeah it feels nice to be able to exhale and not be worried about getting judged because someone would look at me from the outside and be like, you're living your dream. How could you fucking complain about something? And so I don't, I don't really mm-hmm. talk about it, but every now and then if there's an artist that, that I know has been through whatever it is that I, I'm carrying at the time, it's very nice to be able to exhale. Mm-hmm. Is it easy to connect with other no. other artists in the industry? No, but it's not easy for me to connect with people, period. So I, I would say I'm more introverted. Um, so no, it's not easy. But when it happens... It's great because I know it's potent, yeah. you know, resonance. You just connect with someone's frequency. So the f- even though there's not many, the ones that I do have a connection with, I know we'll probably be friends forever. Hmm. That's beautiful. That's yeah, cool. What are you most excited about coming up next for you in the next, like, um, weeks or months? Fuck. The Sam tour. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm excited for this one. It's just going by so fast. I wish this, this European tour was longer. I wish it was longer. How many stops do you still have ahead of you? I think uh, Cologne, the three UK shows, Paris. I think six or seven. Yeah. Yeah, six or seven shows. And about two weeks or a week and a half left. Yeah, it's quick. It's quick. I wish it was longer. So I'm excited to see to see everybody at those in, in those cities. But I'm also, it's a little bittersweet because I know it's going to be quick. But then um, go back to the States work a little more and then get ready for hitting the road again with him. Yeah. Well, just serious. Thank you so much for talking Thank to you. me. Thank you. This was, was great. This is the most in-depth interview. You ask such probing questions. I've never, I've never talked about like, I just never talked about some of the things that I've talked about today. But did you feel uncomfortable talking about it? Yeah, but it's good. No, no, I don't want to make you no, feel no, uncomfortable. No, no, but it's good because some... I'd rather be out of my comfort zone. It makes me more, uh, you're opening me up more in a way that I wouldn't really open up Thank Unless you. someone asked me a probing question, you know? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. You're great cool. at what you do. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Sick. <laughs>